Time now for the Cliff Bar Extended Highlights. Stay 16, the Tour Riders are back on the bikes after a day of rest. We bring you live coverage presented by Viking. We are going into the Pyrenees today, day one of three mountain projects, and it is again hot, and I think it's going to stay that way pretty much all day, which are very, very narrow roads. Let's pick up now with the Geico stage map. Carcassonne finished off the stage two days ago. A much needed rest day for everybody on the Tour de France this year. Couple of early climbs, cat four, cat three, three points total, but then two category one points. La Vellanet, the sprint point. We'll see if Walt Van Aert goes for that. I think he has a big enough lead to win, but the two category ones, both 10 points. So 23 total King of the Mountain points and a sweeping fast, at times technical descent into the Finnish town of Foix. This is an absolutely spectacular race course. We're getting ready. Stand by. Il y a 147 coureurs encore en course. 147 coureurs en course. 5 non partants ce matin. Le 33, le 33, Michael Chérel. Le 38, le 38, Aurélien Paré, peintre, Le 44, le 44, Kamna de Bora Hansgrohe. Le 78, 78, uh, Walshaid, Copilis. Et le 194, 194, Jacob Pouldang de l'équipe Israel, premier sec. Official start. The official start of the day is uh, stage at 12:41. 12:41. Stage 16 of the Tour de France between Carcassonne and Foix. 178.5 kilometers of racing today. 147 riders still in the race. Five non-starters. Number 33, Chirel. Number 38, Barry Number 44, Kamna. Number 78, Wildscheid. And number 194, Fulzang. Well, the riders have started rather gently with the rendezvous with the Pyrenees. Uh, uh, Bob, I, I were told now 147 riders left in the race. There are a few non-starters this morning uh, that we didn't know about until just now. So we'll catch up with that uh, very shortly. But nobody big as far as the names go that we didn't already know about. This group has got clear and we've got some Americans in this group, including Nielsen Paulus up there at the front. Here are all the names for you. Vlasov has made it interesting. Paulus Caruso turns at McNulty, another American. That's two of them. Let's have a look at this. Uh, Jurgensen as well, three. Wim van Aert, Wout van Aert rather, in the green jersey, at it again. Hugo Hull of Canada has made it. Velasco, Tony Gallopan. This is a very interesting combination of riders. These names coming at us, by the way, are new to us as well. Danny Martinez, Michael Storer, Australia, Ausjan of Poland, Michael Woods, also of Canada, Geschke is there, the King of the Mountains leader, Izagira, Buet, Groschon, a champion of Austria, Philippe Gilbert, oldest man in the race, Beisegger, Gougier, Bart, Lagach, Bergodeau, the French are trying to get a stage win today, and Mikel Honoré. This is a superb makeup of rides completed by Akoff and Tim Wellins of the Lotto team. Fourth category climb, and it's the Côte de Saint-Hilaire. We saw the Abbey, now we can see the hill. 1.5 kilometres. There's the standings for you. Simon Gesher, 46 points. The man who's right on the front at the moment. The man who was supposed to have lost this jersey last week in the Alps. He's still battling to win it in Paris as they continue on the climb here. One point only on this climb. It's a fourth category climb. But he'll want the point, and I don't think he'll be challenged because the other riders aren't competing in this competition. Stefan Biesiger might go for this, take a point away. His teammate, Nielsen Palace, nine points behind and 23 points up for grabs today. Tons more still to come, but 
Simon Geschke looking to be climbing well enough. And even if Stefan does sprint him, probably has the legs to take this sprint anyways. Looks like Borgado is trying to come through for total energies. Here goes Simon Geschke going for it. Well, Biesinger trying to come around. He might well. well. I'm not so sure he is, Bob. He's looking with the, he's actually looking for the banner, I think, Biesinger. And the switch to the right of the road. Now, this is only a point. And we sort of dismissed this competition the first week when we talked at one point, but it's still important. And Biesinger has taken it away from Geschke, who didn't work the tactics out well there because when he saw this man on his wheel, he was taking the point because Nielsen Paulus, who's in the breakaway, didn't want to waste his effort, and he features in the King of the Mountains competition. So no score uh, for the uh, German rider there, Geschke. Now, we've got three riders that are just slipping away. Here they are, 64 is Matteo Jorgensen, and also joining in the breakaway is uh, Mathieu Burgodeau and Alexis Gouger. Uh, they've tried to slip away. Pretty unmanageable group. Generally, this would happen a lot closer to the finish, but in modern racing, you got 27 guys and some very, very strong, high-quality riders. I'm thinking about Damiano Caruso, Alexander Vlasov. Uh, you just, you've got to put pressure on them before the climbs. If you guys go to the bottom of the last climb together, you're going to get dropped. So having better, maybe more equally matched to your abilities allies in the breakaway is a very smart tactic. And Matteo has read this right. Now he can take a reasonable turn with turns with the guys he's with and worry about he doesn't have to worry about the fighting to get across to the leaders uh, for the rest of the stage. We only have two riders at the front and the man missing is Matteo Jurgensen. Now we'll show you what happened here as we get five kilometers to the next climb. I think that Matteo just decides that with only two guys and 25 guys chasing it's a much better idea to go back into the big group. Burgado kind of wondering where, where the heck he's going. Uh, Goujard plowing forward, but I would be surprised if this particular scenario was successful for the two guys in front. And the gap is only 54 seconds to a very big and motivated chase group with very high quality riders. So I think that Mateo prudently is going back into the into the chase group yeah he's gone back to the bunch i think it's common sense if you ask me to go back and i think michael matthews and quinn simmons should think about dropping back now to the peloton that's approaching approaching six minutes the king of the mountains as the leader here has five milli, uh, five kilometers to go up the mountain now 5.3 is its actual length he's just started the climb uh, alexis Couger. And he's on his own. He was in the group of three. The other two have gone back to the main chase. Now 28 riders strong. Overall, he's picked away at this lead. and He's kept it through every attack, even through the high mountains. And again, only two points available. Goujard off the front by himself. One kilometer to the top of this climb. Two points up for grabs. One minute and change in front of a large group. 28 riders not that far behind i'm not sure how long the team would want alexis to be up in the in the front um it's just it it's unrealistic to expect you're going to hold off the chase of 28 riders with a slim advantage considering how good the riders in this group are there's the polka dot number 73 leading the competition at the moment, there's one point available on this climb. Kilometre to the summit now for the main peloton, uh, for the main chase rather. The uh, lone leader is just about a minute ahead. They actually did say a minute, but it looks as though it's 108 now for Gougier. The two riders behind are just half a minute ahead of the main peloton. So I think they are just riding now, waiting for the peloton to pick them up. Vlasov, the most dangerous rider in this breakaway in the GC. I'm sure he's moved up a few spots in the virtual standings. A 
about five minutes and ten seconds ahead of the peloton. Um, that does put more pressure on Yumbo Visma than they would like. Generally, it, riders in a long ways down in the overall standings would go in a breakaway today. And it's a bit of a gamble to let Alexander Vlasov have the kind of time he might have before the bottom of the last climb. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see how that works out. And you have two guys with him in the breakaway and two guys chasing, Laporte and Tish Benut. So now you're down to one guy. Yeah, Realistically. The danger, man. I think you're yeah, right, Bob. Because Seth to try to shepherd Jonas yeah. for the final two climbs of the day. That's even if you have Nathan Van der Hoyedonk up the road, it might be better in this, this particular scenario if he's back in the peloton. And if he sees Vlasov, I would leave Wout there for the last climb. And he can ease up and wait for Jonas if need be. And, but I don't know if I was Yumbo Visma, if I would keep Nathan Van Hoyedonk in the breakaway right now, I think I would call him back and help Keith Benut and Christophe Laporte in the chase of Alexander Vlasov. Two points for Gougier has gone over the top, uh, only with 54 seconds. They're coming up towards the points. Trouble here because I don't see any sign of the polka dot jersey here. Simon's going to let this one point go up the road. Not worry about it too much. Biesiger. Same as last time. Biesiger got the point on the previous climb, took it away from court. Now it looks like he's sat up because he knows he's right on the line here. There it is. So B. Sega has taken another point. So despite being in the breakaway, Simon Geschke scored nothing. Pick up with the leaders, 29 riders. Uh, well, Alexis Gouja did try to break away, but he brought, brought him back. But the important man in the break is Vlasov. Nielsen Paulus is at it again, and he usually goes the distance to right to the line in his breakaways, the American. Uh, Matteo Jorgensen is here. Brandon McNulty is here. So three Americans in the break. And we're going to count North Americans, and we should. Hugo Hull is in here as well, as, as so too is Michael Woods and the Australian Air Storer. And an interesting move, this from Ineos with Danny Martinez. The King of the Mountains leader is in there, not scoring too well at the moment Geshka and uh, this is a very very interesting breakaway and at the moment they're holding a lead of just around about five and a half minutes this is the main field it's down to 147 at the start today but 29 of them they're in the lead by six minutes 25 there is one dangerous man up here in Alexander Vlasov he started the day 1023 down overall and uh, so in another four minutes Again, he'll be the virtual leader of the Tour de France. So it started off a gentle day for the race leaders. We can guarantee it's going to finish a very tough day for the race leaders. There's uh, Roman Bardet there. He was the first rider over the last time we climbed the Porte de Lairs in 2019. And uh, maybe he'll be the same again when we get there in a few hours' time. Five hundred meters. Time to flag the green jersey. There he is on the front, Bob. Respect for the man who has led this competition from day two. He's going to be challenged. It's almost tempting him to come out here. Wow. Oh dear. He won't be. He won't be impressed with that. He got no, pushed he into second place. I I can't believe what I just seen. That. Well, there's no way he will like that because there wasn't much point in doing that. I think, was it Denezi who did that? A DSM rider. Wow. I mean, there's... Uh, no if you think Walt's <laughs> going to be pleased with that, he, <laughs> and he started elbowing him into the curb, like asking him, what the heck do you think you're doing? That was a very, very strange... <laughs> This tour never ceases to amaze, that's for sure. Anyway, no damage done, of course. The green jersey, good till stage 19 in the Tour de France now for Wout van Aert. This is his Marc Soler, the Spanish rider on the same team as the second place rider in the race, Tadej Pogacar, and he could be the end of a very valued teammate here. 
Had really bad luck last year, by the way, in Mark Salerno. He crashed on day one. He broke a number of bones, but he finished the stage and didn't start next day. So that's the line that we're left with, Bob. Tade, obviously their GC rider, but Bennett gone, Langen gone, Matteo Trentin before the Tour de France even started. He's gone. Mark Hirschi has had a very tough Tour de France who replaced Matteo Trentin in spite of the fact that he had just started to recover from COVID. And so you're down. Mark Soler also potentially. You only have Brandon, Micah. You're running out of actual people you could use to put pressure on Jonas Vingigo. And so the disadvantage that seemed pretty apparent with the loss of both Steven Kreuzweg and, of course, Primoz Roglic to Jonas doesn't seem as dramatic at this point in the race if Marc Soler doesn't start feeling a whole lot better and stay in the Tour de France. Well, the one man who's got in this breakaway that wasn't noticed at first is Alexander Vlasov. And looking at the virtual situation now, Vlasov is now up into the top five. Another three minutes 39, he'll be the virtual leader of the Tour de France. And uh, this is probably the reason why this breakaway was going nicely, but they've now monitored it and they're keeping it just under seven minutes. Back with the doctor and Mark Soler. I think she's going to come out to the car here to treat him. That's why she's put the mask on. Well, very difficult. I couldn't hear what he was saying there, Bob. He was obviously um, a Spanish accent. I think the doctor would have been trying to speak to him in English, but I couldn't hear the word. But it, it's a, a deep discussion, that's for sure. Absolutely. Definitely in distress. Now, we're going back to the back of the race here, the Voiture Ballet. And I think when the camera swings left, we're going to find Marc Soler. He's had further conversations with the doctor. Uh, Robbie Hunter has told us he's gone back to check in with his team. Uh, it is clear he has been vomiting because it's on his jersey. I, I hope you're not having breakfast uh, in the USA, but uh, that's the situation. It's a sad sight, and Mark doesn't want to give up, but he's now in a situation that Mikkel Morkoff was in two days ago, who rode all the way to the finish, and they eliminated, eliminated him uh, for being outside of the time allowance for the days. Very hard to do, I would have thought. We've literally just turned on to the lower slopes of the Port de l'Air here. It's a climb of 11.4 kilometers, 2,600 feet, a big gradient here at 7%. Now, the, because the roads are narrow on these climbs, there's been spectators allowed on this one, but I think they've been banned from the next one. We'll find out. There's the current standings in the King of the Mountains. Geshka is in this leading group. The leading group, all of a sudden, has just uh, these two riders, Damione Caruso and Legach. Uh, ten points for the first place, so it's a good one to get some points for the King of the Mountains, who is in the breakaway, Simon Geska. Leading the chase here at the moment, number 41 at the front there is Alexander Vlasov with the most to gain in this breakaway just now. He started the day 10th overall, but we've still got Damione Caruso. Nobody could go with him, so he's off on his own. So let's have a look how we stand with Vlasov in the virtual. He's actually climbed now to fourth place in the race, only two minutes 55 off the yellow jersey. The infighting is between Vingago and Pogaccia, but they're in the peloton at seven minutes 54. This is the leader, and another shower for him as he climbs now this massive climb of the Port de, de l'Air. There's a move by Nielsen Paulus here as he's decided to jump round and Geska's straight after him too. He wants a leg up in that King of the Mountains jersey. Big points at the top on this first category climb. So it's Geska and Nielsen locked together in combat for that King of the Mountains lead. Danny Martinez, 22, and Brandon McNulty, number six, also trying to get across to Nielsen Paulus. This is a raid on the polka dots. There's still plenty of points available at the top of these next two climbs. 
the chase group for the moment is under a little bit of disarray. Valentin Madwas in our picture here is going back towards the group. He tried to reach the leaders, and this was moments ago. Nielsen Paulus looks to be in trouble now at the back of what's left of this front group, which was at one time 29 riders. So let's go and have a look up at the three leaders now. Michael Woods and uh, Michael Storer caught up with Damiano Caruso, Bob. Caruso looked to be rampaging away with this, a handy lead on the chasers, including that man Vlasov just on the front of the camera. Now up to the first three, Storers and Woods have done a very good ride to get across to Damiano Caruso. This might be the best three climbers in that group. So wouldn't be surprised if they hold off the pursuers. But Vlasov is trying to keep things organized. It's not super steep part of the Col de Lairs. It'll get steeper in the middle and then ease off much like this gradient before the top. So there is still some time for the chasers, but now they're a minute behind and they're going to have a really a hard chase. They can only hope that the three front runners start to weaken on the last climb to have a shot at the chase at the at the stage win. Matteo Jorgensen is on the chase now, closing down on the three front runners in the green and polka dots. Walt Van Aert and Simon Geschke, Brandon McNulty still cooling their jets but Matteo Jorgensen now he's understanding the danger of Storer Woods and Caruso up the road so trying to do some damage control it might have been better to go with them but maybe wasn't able at the moment they attacked but now seems to have his momentum nose to the grindstone closing the gap down it's yo-yoing right around 50 seconds with four k's to go on Look the climb that is Yes, on the climb, and there's still one more to come, of course, for 35 kilometres from the finish, and it's uh, now inside that to the top of the climb. Caruso, Stora, Wood. Stora in his first Tour de France, he's an Australian. Uh, he is a good rider, but we've seen virtually nothing of in this race, but it looks like he's finding his legs. Now we've got down into the Pyrenees. Wild Van Aert getting Look across. This. And, and I remember going back about 10 days ago, uh, when we were talked to Jerkinson about getting in breakaways, and he'd just been in one with the boy in the green jersey. He says, yeah, I'd love to get in a breakaway again, but hey, uh, I don't think I want to be in a breakaway with that man in green again, but look at it now. <laughs> <laughs> Good asset on a stage like this, that's for sure. And Wild Van Art wants to make sure that he's off the front before the last climb of the day. The easiest way to do that is go over to the top with the, the most time that he has. Mateo sees the green jersey. Can't believe what he's seeing. <laughs> well, not him again. Art not him a, again. On a yeah. category one <laughs> climb. That shows you how strong Walt Van Aert is. Simon so, Geschke going forward. Three riders in front of him. Well, these are good. These are so important, these points at the top of this climb for Simon Geschke. This is a first category of climb. These are the leaders. Michael Woods of Canada is at the front. Geschke trying to get up there now. Here, the first eight riders on a first category of climb will get points in the King of the Mountains. Nielsen Paulus, who's close to Geschke, is having a bit of problems of his own at the back of the group. So Geschke's seeing his chance now. No, this is not the leading riders on the Tour de France, but it's probably the most significant because Enrique Maas, who's in the overall, has just attacked the yellow jersey group here. This is how he did it. It was a planned move. Three riders from Movie Star trying to get clear. No reaction from the field yet. Two riders in the breakaway for Movie Star. Let's see if Matteo Jorgensen isn't asked to come back. If if Enrique Moss starting the day 10th in the overall standings, almost 10 minutes behind, but with this move, looking to move way up in the overall standings. Walt Van Aert in the green jersey, swinging up to Damiano Caruso on a category one climb. And Michael Woods and Michael Storer, by the way, impressive riding by the Belgian in the green jersey. Yes, Walt Van Aert has shown us in the past he can do it all. I mean, no matter what the tactics are, it's just amazing to watch the man in green race the Tour de France. It's just can do uh, very few sprinters can be in the front group with the king of the mountains <laughs> on a category one climb. And it's just incredible watching him race. So how that works out tactically remains to be seen, but very impressive nonetheless. Geschke moves smoothly to do his pacemaking here at the front. 10 points will keep him well in the lead in the green jersey, in the polka dot jersey competition. And he may be, if he has another day like this tomorrow, 
just start dreaming of taking Polkadot all the way to Paris, and that was never remotely in his mind. Tish and he Benut. took the lead. Tish Benut off the back a long ways from the finish for the yellow jersey of Jonas Vingago. I would imagine Nathan Van Hoyadonk is in the gap between the leaders and this group. But Jonas Vingago down to Sepp Kuss a long ways from the finish. That is worrying for Jumbo Visma. Up the road is the catcher in the rye though. Wout Van Aert if needed. Jonas probably can follow the wheels. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Wout Van Aert didn't win day before yesterday. <laughs> Got a chance to win the stage today, but team orders might require him that he wait for the yellow jersey of Jonas Vingigo. Geske living the moment here. We're on the climb of the Port de l'Air, but the next climb, the Mieux de Peguer, the last man who, to, well, last time he rode this hill was in 2019. First man over the top was Simon Geske. I believe that's Nelson Oliveira coming back from the acceleration of Enrique Moss and Carlos Verona to the chasing peloton. 10 points. Geshka on the front at the moment. That's in his mind just now. And the first six get the points. The only other rider with any remote interest in this front group was Paulus, but he's not here. And he's not going to score points at the moment. This could be a big hit for Geshka. Absolutely. And the last time he climbed, the next climb, the Mieux de Pegueur back in 2019, Geshka won that one as well. A climb he enjoys out of the saddle, looking over his shoulder just to make sure nobody's trying to come around <laughs> where they have been, shaking his head. Wow, that's a handy lead now. Required a lot of effort. Let's see if he can recover and get any points on the last climb of the day. Another category one, Phil. Yes, and note there that the green jersey of Wout van Aert did not make any attempt to pass I the man whose competition was, was Dylan, special to him. Dylan Toons coming through, teammates with Damiano Caruso, not far behind the seven riders. Here's the next chase group. Dylan Toons looking to get back on terms on this descent. We're back with the Tour de France. This is the main field, and the attacks have started because moments ago, Tadi Pogaccia launched an attack and caught everyone off guard. There he comes out of the left, Bob. The yellow jersey wasn't ready for this. Still away from the top of this climb, a category one, and Tadi Pogaccia goes on the offensive because the yellow jersey down to one teammate at the moment, Sepp Kuss, and he's going again now, Phil. Oh, these are live pictures now, and he's just hit him again, and Vingago has gone after him, but look at everybody else and not sure what to do now, as they're going one over another here now. We're still coming to the top with the peloton to the Port de Les. Pogaccia, last time looked over his shoulders, saw the yellow shadow tucked in behind, and just shrugged his shoulders and sat up, and it looks like he's done the same again. David Godou must be the group armor rider trying to get yep. across to the two leaders. Garrett Thomas in the yellow helmet trying to get back himself. He'll bite, just catch on. But let's see if Tade Pogaccia doesn't continue oh, to now, keep these accelerations going. Vingago checked out Gadu and thought, I'm not bothered. But when he saw Geraint Thomas come up in the sunglasses there, he immediately moved into the line behind Cairo and uh, Quintana. Let's see if Sepp Kuz can't get back to the front from the Yumbo team. There he is on the outside of that corner in the yellow helmet. Just coming into position to stu to keep doing tempo for Tadi Pogaccia, or for Jonas Vingigo, excuse me. A long ways from the finish. And Sepp Kuz wants to restore some order, try to set a hard tempo, but I'm pretty sure Sepp doesn't want to start his work this far from the finish line. But Sepp Kuz now in the front, and Bardet, after reacting to that, now he's starting to open up gaps. Having a little bit of a hard time at the moment. See if he can't collect himself and get his rhythm back. And Tadi Pogaccia grabbing a water bottle. Nairo Quintana in the red jersey is there. And Rafael Micah also. We're nearly on the top of the climb here. They're going to go down and do it all again. As they come up towards the summit, led over by Sepp Kuss and the green and the yellow jersey of Vingago. A bit of here he goes. This man has gone for it down the hill immediately. He was unlucky there because Vingago was looking at him. He got him straight away. Now, oh my goodness me, this is not for the nervous now because they're going to fly down what is a really bad descent. Very narrow roads, very twisting. At least it's in out of the forest, at least. Tadipo Pogaccia putting the pressure on the yellow jersey. We know how good a descender. 
Tadej Pogace is the difference perhaps is the pressure of the yellow jersey for Jonas Vingigo. One mistake could be very costly. Check over his shoulder, but Ineos are getting themselves organized. Remember, Tom Pickcock is a great descender. We saw that when he won on Alp Duez. He'll try and bring Geraint Thomas back up to them now with a great descent. Mars, by the way, let's not forget, he's still in front, but not by much. About 18 seconds according to the clock. Didn't take Pogaccia very long to close down. The advantage that Enrique Moss established on the previous climb. Vingigo so far up to the task. Just literally started this last climb of the day, the Mur de Peguer. 9.3 kilometers long, 2,400 feet gain, 7.9 average gradient. Hugo Hull of Canada has got himself out onto the front now. He's just taken advantage of a slight lull as the chase regrouped a little bit behind. Geshka leads the King of the Mountains, increased the lead on the last climb. Another 10 points available if you can do the same again, this time up the Pagir. Pagir and a second eight, six, two, three, three, two, one, down to the top six finishes. Menke's going off the front. Now this is an interesting move, this, because Louis Menke's moving clear. No immediate reaction yet, but Menkes has been making steady progress up the overall classification of the Tour de France. He had a good day the other, the other day. He's now up to seventh place overall. And more importantly, he's only just over four minutes behind. I think we can show you that right now. And four minutes is not much on a climb like this. There it is, Menkes at 4.24. They can't give him much rope, that's for sure. There goes Michael Storer. Covering Michael Woods a little bit surprising since he has a teammate up the road. Now Storr has come around and Storr now has dropped his teammate, Madois, Matteo Jorgensen, up to the task so far, sitting on the wheel. So good riding by the man from Boise, Idaho. And it would be better maybe to wait until Pogaccia oh. starts his attacks, which can't be far now, Phil. He, no, he spotted Micah moving forward. I saw the yellow jersey twitch when he saw Micah come to the front. Then he saw the white jersey take his wheel. Uh, Vingago knows he's going to be under pressure again any moment now. They just went through the 4Ks to the top of this KOM banner. And at 3Ks to go to the top of the KOM, it gets really steep, 18% gradient. So watch for that launch pad to send Tati Pogaccia into the stratosphere if he has the legs to do it. This is the lone leader holding on to a 30 second gap. This is very impressive uh, riding by the Canadian Hugo Hull. It was. Store drop, that's a surprise. Ouch. So Matteo Jorgen still, still riding strong in with a chance for the stage win, trying to close down his disadvantage for him. Michael Woods on his wheel is a little disadvantage too. Michael Woods, a teammate up the road. Big diesel of Geraint Thomasville starting to fire now. Whoa, Micah slipped a gear and almost took Ouch. out Pogaccia. Oh. Ow, he just let, had, oh, that's, let's see what happens now to this tactical situation. Step Coots back to the front. Let's see how Tati Pogaccia handles this. That's just, something's broken there. It might, it's a chain's broken, it's gone. It's like his chain is chain completely is blown off. Yeah. Wow. Chain has snapped. Uh, now, there's no immediate attack come from these two riders. They saw it happen. They wouldn't attack a, a rider down in that situation. But Sepp Kuss has gone to take up the pacemaking now. And it's gone back to advantage at the yellow jersey. There's Micah down there. That's where how it happened. Let's uh, get back in and chat with Robbie Hunter. Robbie. Phil, he's busy walking up the hill. As you said, his chain snapped. The vehicles are about 15, 20 seconds back because... The road is so narrow, they haven't been able to come past uh, the riders. So it's going to be extremely difficult for a guy like him to come back at this point in time. The road is extremely steep. A lot of riders are suffering right now, and cars are just not able to service their riders. Well, that's really sad, Bob. A broken chain is not uncommon in racing these days. You might be tell, able to tell me why. Uh, but let's go up to the leader now because he comes up to the summit. That's a 
brilliant ride by Hugo Hull. Can he hold it now for the next 27 kilometers? Tighten down your bootstraps, the green jersey from the breakaway now in the front of the yellow jersey group. <laughs> And the green jersey is back with the yellow jersey. That, there's your answer. He's waited on top of the climb. He's gone back to the yellow jersey, and he's now pacing him through. This will make it much tougher on Tade Pogaccia to get any serious advantage over Jonas Vingago, that's for sure. Two teammates with Vingago. Jumbo Visma continuing to be the dominant team in this year's Tour de France. Right out of the beginning of this tour, I remember Pogaccia saying, you can't win this race without the team. And that's exactly what Pogaccia has to do. He has no team. And here's Brandon McNulty, teammate of Tade Pogaccia, coming back from the breakaway as well. And so Jonas has two teammates, but thankfully for the UAE squad, Brandon McNulty, if he needs to, can save the day for Tade Pogaccia. Lone leader, now up to 30 seconds lead. So Matteo Jorgensen chasing hard and having a hard time catching Hugo Hull, the lone leader. Oh, dear me. That is Matteo Jorgensen overcooking the entrance to that corner and going down in the pursuit of the lone leader. Oh, but he's getting back up quickly. Watch this again. And uh, Michael Woods there having to correct his angle completely, and he's gone through, but uh, Jorgensen, uh, Jorgensen is up. Let's hope he can get himself back into uh, organization here because we're only eight miles from the finish line of the tour. This is Jorgensen down there. Now, he's not on my time aboard. Uh, but the 39-second chase is actually Michael Woods, another Canadian. And somewhere after that and before chase two is this man here. He got himself up. He lost a big chance there. But if he, and he's gone under 10 kilometers to go now. So he might well be that 1 minute 16 now, Bob, I think. Amazing That's recovery off. by... Matteo Jorgensen, don't think it'll translate to a successful stage win, but you've got to admire the tenacity of the young American. I'd settle for the first three places on the mountain stage in the Pyrenees in your first Tour de France. Crash damage obvious to the body, but the pedaling still strong and smooth for Matteo Jorgensen. 45 seconds in the last five, four miles and change. Don't think it's going to happen, but courageous Ooh. descent after crashing Ru for Rusty Jorgensen. wasn't expecting that return. He almost missed the train. I wasn't expecting it either. That's impressive riding by Matteo. Goodness knows what's going through his mind right now, Bob. On the brink of becoming an absolute star of the Tour de France with a stage win and a historic win too. He is still absolutely steamrolling these stretches of pavement. Three miles to glory for the lone leader, Hugo Hull. Tade Pogaccia. No attacks today. Not the minute the Michael lost his chain, broke his chain, that turned the power off of Pogaccia. He was on the defensive after that. Danny Martinez, 22, bringing Garrett Thomas back into the group impressively. Three riders from North America eclipsing at this first day in the Pyrenees today. Grew up with his brother watching the Tour de France. Tragically, his brother was killed in a hit and run accident while out exercising, and Hugo Hull has had to carry on without the support, guidance, leadership, and camaraderie of his brother. And this is what he's been dreaming about. This is why he's put 100%. the hard miles in. Year in and year out, trying to get a stage win in the Tour de France to honor the memory of his brother. He's one kilometer away from doing that. Uh, and this, by the way, is a rider who's never won a road race in his life as a professional. He's won three time trials, but never a road race. And he chooses the Tour de France to start. Wow. Storin Madwas trying to catch back up to Woods and Jorgensen. That might happen. A little bit of a kick up. Red kite. And just Whoa, a thousand meters for Huel. We are in the streets of Foire. One kilometer to go. There's a nasty roundabout coming up. Uh, and they'll turn left and flick right. And he'll be up to the finishing line. They can't catch him now. He's won his stage of the Tour de France for Canada. Steve Barra, who watches and still is very, very active in the sport of cycling, was the last winner for Canada in 1998. Here he comes, and all of the ovation will be for Hugo Hull and his late brother, Pirik.
for you, period, for you. Who wins the stage for Canada? And now the sprint, and it's three-man sprint, and you saw the tricky finish. Jurgensen, I would say, is the best sprinter, but can he do it now? Madras has come back into the frame for second on the stage. You have a 180 degree turn in the last 300 meters before it kicks up to the finish line. Storer trying to get back on terms. Looks like Mateo is going to lead into the last corner. That's not a bad tactic. It's very short from the last corner to the finish line. There goes Madwas trying to get a little bit of an advantage before the last turn. He came on late. He can't have much left. He's had to go first. France, remember, we've got nothing from this Tour de France yet. And Rusty has gone onto his wheel. Another Canadian. This is the nasty right turn flick here. And then it goes round again. And then you flick to the right and you climb to the finish. And Rusty is gritting his teeth here, but I think Madwas is a bit of a man possessed, but he's got to climb to the finish. Is this going to be a 1-2 for Canada? Oh, no, it's a 1-1 because he was third. Well, Van Aert will lead them over. 5.35 should be some interesting changes in the overall little bit here. Oh, they've got round that corner. I was worried when I saw that this morning. Then they flick right again, but look at this now. He starts to go clear. More points in the bag as he tries to race the line. There's nobody can match this man in a sprint. And Val Van Aert has got more points in that green jersey competition. Hugo Hull, first time atop stage 16 is his. Michael Woods, fellow Canadian, coming in at third. And the American, Matteo Jorgensen, at fourth. Good job of getting back on that bike. No doubt. And finding his way to the finish line in quality time. Hugo Hull, 31 years old, fourth time he's been in the Tour de France. First time he's been in this spot right here. You'll never forget the name Foi, for sure. And what a <laughs> great place to get this, nice in the shade. I'm sure all the athletes will be very happy to be in the shade downtown here after baking in the hot sun. There's quite a bit more climbing to come. Tomorrow it's worse, and then of course Thursday, I don't want to say it. It gets a lot worse. <laughs> it gets a lot worse. <laughs> the next two stage, big mountain stages here in the Tour de France. But for this moment on this stage, Hugo is the champion of the day. Yellow jersey standings, one, two, and three. No change with the names or with the time. But then we see the change. Nairo Quintana started the day in sixth. He is now on the first page. David Gadu was in eighth, and he is now in at fifth. These changes, because mostly because Roman Bardet, who was fourth, dropped all the way to ninth, and that caused some of the se separation and movement from what we saw this morning. Jonas Vingago, and I'll remember a lot of things about stage 16, Christian, but one of them will certainly be when Pagacha made those attacks on that uh, the first of two climbs, two cat one climbs, he had no issue at all. Kind of ho-hum, I'll reel this one back in. Now we're dead even again. No, Teddy definitely caught him with his pants down on the first one, and that was a big gap. And the, the way he went across that gap was so impressive, and the speeds that he was generating on gradients up to 7 to 8%, so he's looking really good.